produce a documentary on uranium mine tailings. They gave us a camera and told us we had nine weeks to complete the project. It looked like the ideal summer job for four students, but there was a problem. Would anyone want to watch a video on mine tailings? Besides, we'd grown up in Elliott Lake, a northern Ontario mining town. We'd lived with tailings all our lives, but had never given them much thought. Until now. The more research we did, the more complex the assignment became. Everyone, including town officials, mining executives, and scientists, cooperated fully, and we soon had more technical reports than you could shake a stick at. In fact, we began to doubt our own ability to complete the project. Our research seemed to suggest that there really wasn't a problem. End of story. End of documentary. I perceive Elliott Lake as a poison place. Uh, one solution I haven't touched upon that uh, I, I must raise, and that is that we divert the watershed and divert the Serpent River so it doesn't go through Elliott Lake anymore, and we put a fence around Elliott Lake with a sign and tell people to stay out. The best blueberries in the world are on Stan Rock Road, and that's downstream from the, the tailings. I certainly hope the scientists are correct. You know, I, I tell people to go ahead and eat the fish. So I hope I'm not uh, leading them astray. Were we too hasty in coming to our conclusions? Maybe this small northern Ontario mining town had a story to tell after all. Elliott Lake. This community of 15,000 is situated 30 kilometers north of Lake Huron in northern Ontario. 150 kilometers west of Sudbury. The uranium capital of the world was a classic boomtown, cut from the harsh northern wilderness. As the uranium industry experienced ups and downs, so did Elliott Lake. Over the years, many mines have opened and closed. The one remaining mine, Stanley, owned by Rio Algum, is scheduled to close in 1996, leaving the uranium capital of the world without a uranium mine. At 7 a.m. Wednesday morning, this is where many employees of Rio Algo and Stanley Mine begin their day as they descend 4,000 feet below the Earth's surface. Their job is to extract the uranium from the host ore body, which is then sold to Ontario Hydro as fuel for nuclear reactors. To shed some light on this rarely explored activity, we took our camera underground to learn more about the mining process. Roger Payne, an official with Rio Algum, explained. So what we have is a large underground mining operation, a large piece of equipment to actually drill the holes, blast the rock and bring it to surface. The amount of uranium that's actually associated with a quartz conglomerate is quite small in other way, somewhere around one and a half pounds to two pounds for every ton of ore that we mine. Underground we crush the ore to about minus six inches, it's brought to surface at about that sort of size where he undergoes secondary crushing and then grinding so that in fact the product that we actually deal with in the processing is a, a fine sand. After we've taken out the material that we're going to use as uh, uh, our end product, what we have is a, a large quantity of waste material which we call tailings, which is simply the crushed rock that we bring to surface after we've removed the 
one and a half to two pounds of uranium. As I mentioned, it's a conglomerate, so it's a quartz conglomerate, so the material that is substantially uh, silica, so it's very much like sand. So 90% of it is a material very similar to sand, uh, with about 10% other naturally occurring products. So it's not things that we add into the process, so they're just naturally occurring minerals that are brought to surface with the ore. It's about 5%, unfortunately, is a material called pyrite, which is iron sulfide. And, uh, this is one of the products that causes us some problems in our processing and the final disposal of the material. Uh, and the other 5% are just miscellaneous natural uh, occurring minerals, uh, small amounts of other, other elements of, um, and metals, uh, and a small amount of radioactive material. Our early research indicated that except for the pyrite, the tailings seemed harmless. We continued our investigation. Oxidation is a chemical process that in the case of the tailings takes the sulfide rock, the pyrites, the fool's gold, and in the presence of oxygen, water, and with the help of some bacteria, turns it into sulfuric acid. It in fact is the source of acid generation and much of the problem of any tailings in this area, or for Sudbury for that matter. Anywhere where there's a lot of sulfur along with the metal ores. But we were still concerned about radiation. The amount of radioactive material in the tailings might be small, but what about its environmental impact? What we do is uh, look at a person living actually on Quirk Lake, who uh, takes, his water, takes all his drinking water from Quirk Lake, or all the Serpent River in that area, who fishes and eats fish from the Serpent River, who hunts deer and moose in the area, eats, eats deer and moose, spends some time of his life uh, on a frequent basis wandering, hunting if you like, in the, in the waste management areas themselves, uh, and taking all that lifestyle together uh, and looking at what, hit, what the difference is going to be, what, what his net increase, if you like, of exposure to radiation is, uh, those studies indicate that really it's a very small percentage of the amount of radiation that we're normally exposed to in our everyday life. You can calculate that if you spend 200 hours a year in the area of the, the wastes, um, you would receive roughly the equivalent of four or five chest x-rays. Now the limits on radiation, the dose that you can receive as a, a Canadian citizen, uh, non, uh, not working in the uranium industry, is about 5,000 units. Uh, that represents about a hundred chest x-rays. So we're looking at a long exposure on the tailings being roughly equivalent to five, out, five chest x-rays. My understanding is uh, that there's evidence to show, firstly, that low level radiation over a long period of time is more dangerous than high level radiation over an instantaneous period of time. It's a moot question whether radiation is harmful in small amounts. Uh, that's not something I can attempt to answer now. Uh, the levels are very small and they're also produced by natural outcrops. The mines and the tailings are not the only sources of radiation in the area. We were reassured that the levels of radiation given off by the tailings were insignificant. However, there was still public concern regarding the effect of tailings on the food chain. Our people are not uh, hunting and fishing like they used to. And um, the tragedy is that this is part of our culture. And so part of our culture is being lost because the younger generations are not learning how to do this. And so it's going to be lost. If nobody teaches, then it's going to be lost forever. And that's the real tragedy. And, and uh, the reason they're not doing it is because they're afraid of what the, 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 uh, the effects of, of uh, radiation are going to do to them. The levels of radioactivity in the, uh, the things that we eat, like moose or uh, grouse or muskrat or beaver, are uh, really quite low. In the case of uh, beaver and muskrat, you'd have to eat many, many kilos of kidneys and liver before you we got anywhere near the limits. And if you're eating only flesh, 
you'd have to eat hundreds of kilos, thousands of kilos in the course of a year before you uh, came up against the, the limit on intake. Oh, sure. I'd believe that, but so what? Uh, is, it, is it traces that prove... I mean, what if every one of those little traces causes cancer? I don't know of any studies that, that show there's any damage to the ecosystem or to the individuals living here, animals or humans or plants, uh, which is attributable to radiation as such. No, we think that so. You, you, you've never convinced us before, and uh, um, you'll have to place before us uh, a completely set of new types of arguments in order to convince us that that's so. I believe in cumulative impacts. I mean, who's to say that the genetic, that there isn't a visible, let's suppose that there are very small traces. Um, who's to say that the genetic impacts of that may not show up for three or four generations? But it was that radionuclide, even though it was a, was a trace, that, that triggered that in the fourth generation down the road. The native people talk about seven generations. I like that when you talk about radioactivity. I like thinking in terms of seven generations. When Rio can convince me that the seventh generation down the road isn't going to be impacted by these tailings, I might consider, if they can prove that, I might consider listening to them. How would you respond to those who perceive radiation as highly dangerous? and will not be convinced otherwise until its effects on future generations are assessed. Well, of course, if someone was to say that to me, I would say, well, you obviously don't really want a proof because no one can prove that unless they come back seven generations hence. Uh, uh, if someone was living here in a tent in Elliott Lake, without there being any uranium mining, uh, you could study them for seven generations and see if there are any effects on the progeny because in fact, as I said before, the levels in this area are high naturally. And there are many other areas of the world with, with high radiation levels. The Elliott Lake region is currently in transition from a mining-based economy to a tourism-based economy. What do people who depend upon tourism think about the tailing sites? I certainly hope the scientists are correct. I really do hope that the level of the radionuclides is sufficiently low to pose no threat. Um, you know, I, I tell people to go ahead and eat the fish, so I hope I'm not uh, leading them astray. Um, what more can we do, really? You know, if, if people who study the fish and study the animals tell us that it's, it's so low, there's nothing to worry about, then that's the, I think that's the thing to do. Um, what you're left wondering is how low is low enough? You know, what's the bottom threshold that's safe? Um, and what, what background test do they have to know when it's low enough? But if you don't trust the scientific community at some point, um, you're left trusting no one. We soon discovered that people's concerns about the content of the tailings stemmed from the methods of disposal and management, which brought up the obvious question, what do they do with this uranium mine waste? We have to be sure that when we select a site, that in fact that site is going to be very much uh, an engineered facility which will allow us to be quite sure that the material is going to be well contained, that it's not going to be escaping into the environment. What we do is um, employ uh, independent consultants who do a, a site selection study. That study primarily is a geological study. So what we're interested in is, uh, is the containment, is the geological formation going to be adequate to uh, properly, properly contain the material without any losses. Uh, those studies we then uh, submit to the governing agency that looks after the uh, operations in Elliott Lake, which in our case is the Atomic Energy Control Board, and they, together with the other federal and provincial agencies that are uh, associated and are interested in what's going on in Elliott Lake, uh, look at the proposal that Rialgan makes and um, we then have some discussions and eventually choose or select a, what we think is the most appropriate. So what we're doing is uh, in Elliott Lake is we're 
flooding the tailings. We think this is the right way to go as far as the Quergan panel facilities are concerned. And from our uh, uh, work, our research, uh, and all our investigations, we believe that in a relatively short period of time after the tailings have been flooded, there won't be any further requirement for treatment. Because this site is almost waterlogged, the, the oxidation is taking place very, very slowly. What do you see here? Since last 35 years, these tailings have been sitting here. You could see the oxidation front only a few centimeters below the surface. The orange color, the, the light beige color, what do you see? Are the tailings that have been oxidized? What do you see? The gray color are unoxidized tailings. And the main reason it is taking place very slowly because these tailings are waterlogged. The oxygen is prevented from entering to the tailings grain and therefore the oxidation is only limited to the surface where the water level is moving up and down. One can minimize the effect on the uh, production of radionuclides into the air from the tailings and production of acidity okay, in the tailings by putting them under water. So step one is to put them under water. You need about a minimum of two feet of water. That's a short-term solution. Sure. Our longer term idea is that if one, they're going to be around for another 500, 5,000, 10,000, 10,000 years. And to have sort of valleys with dams and then water on top of the tailings, sort of, which may drain or the dam may leak. Yeah. Uh, if that happens, one of course has the tailings exposed and the acidity will start to be regenerated again. So the idea is to actually take those initial water covers and convert them through to, to wetlands, like marshes. Well, I don't know how you can create a 10,000 acre wetland. I don't know how you can cover 200 million tons of tailings with water and have a wetland. I mean, and think that those dams are going to hold that water. A wetland is something that moves around. A wetland can be a wetland one year and then the, swamp, the beaver can move in and it can be somewhere else the next year. Now, no disrespect to Dr. Beckett. I don't know him personally. Theoretically, it's a good thing, uh, you know. You, and if they're willing to take these, if they're willing to take these 200 million tons of tailings and spread them out all across the country, maybe in wetlands, I mean the country of Canada, then I might buy it. But if you've got to concentrate it, there's no way, it's just, it's not gonna work. You can't engineer nature. As a biologist, I don't really like the word engineer nature. One can work with nature or work against nature. Okay. We're now, we're hoping to work with, with nature here. If, if we take any lake, any pond, yeah, in the long run, yeah, if one looks at the, the, the history of that pond or lake, it's going to turn from a pond or lake into a wetland and eventually into a woodland. If people see tailings in that state with, with uh, vegetation growing on it and wild ducks on it and whatever, I mean, people are naturally going to say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, why would, ducks wouldn't be landing there, there wouldn't be vegetation growing there if there was anything wrong with it. So, to that extent, uh, it's devious. I'm not sure, like I said, that, that, that it's not dangerous in the vegetation that grows from the contaminants and also contains the, the contaminants within itself. But beyond that, though, um, Nobody, will, I don't think, will ever be able to convince us that if you remove the water, you're not going to have the same problem as you have before. I mean, the contaminants are going to be exposed to the environment again, and they're, so, you know, I, I, we just can't be convinced that that is a viable option. What we'll be left with is shallow, shallow lakes, quite large in area, and we believe that naturally some vegetation will establish itself around the perimeters of the basins. There, there are some engineering benefits to getting uh, vegetation established. The, the vegetation itself will help protect the, the slopes of the dams, the, the edges of the roads, minimize future care and maintenance that's going to be required to maintain those things. The vegetation, basically, we, we view the, the use of vegetation for two main reasons. First of all, it provides the erosion control. 
all right it holds the soil in place with this the roots and and therefore you have no erosion because of wind or wave action or something and the other important function that the vegetation provide it provides when the vegetation dies it becomes an organic matter that provides an organic rich sediment on the top of tailings and what this organic sediment does it takes up the oxygen whatever the oxygen is there in the water and therefore the oxygen is not available to the tailings to oxidize anymore and hence they they provide two purposes controls the erosion improves the aesthetic greatly which is also very important and it gives the necessary organic cover on top of tailings which consumes all the oxygen and it is therefore not available to the tailings to oxidize and therefore if you have an organic cover on tailings you could keep the tailings forever i, I think uh, <coughs> The program wasn't to um, be successful at planting cattails. Uh, the technology and the understanding is well understood. I mean, it's, it's as to what cattails like in the way of an environment, and you'll find there's been lots of cattail communities established. And what we were looking at was, uh, in the particular conditions that we have in this one particular area of, of Quirk. Uh, how well would a cattail community behave, perform, or live in an environment that isn't totally suitable to them? So all the, ones, all the cattails we've put in, okay, we've got about 50% sort of success. 50%? Yeah. I think success is going to be judged over the years as opposed to over the months, so it's very difficult uh, to interpret what we have. I mean, we're very satisfied with what, what we've seen um, survive this tough winter and the amount of vegetation that we have there right now but that evaluation will continue and we have further programs in place with the research field station to look at extending that program and that information into other areas of the basin and we'll continue to do that. Here are the much talked about tailing ponds although you won't see them on any postcard. Presently work is in progress to convert these areas into flooded wetlands capable of sustaining local wildlife for generations to come. However, all of this depends on the integrity of the dams and their ability to withstand what we sometimes refer to as an act of God. Engineers uh, can design things that are on paper perfect, but in my opinion, you know, Three Mile Island, uh, there's all kinds of things that engineers have designed that uh, were perfect in design, but yet nature, or should we say maybe God made a mistake. He didn't act according to expected behavior and some unexpected environmental weather, uh, something happens and engineers never make mistakes but God does that's my concern my concern with the water cover is I I would love to see proof that uh, they can build a dam that'll last 80,000 years there's no way they can do it it can't be done we're in an earthquake zone there's earthquakes here it's not gonna happen the pyramids aren't that old do you have any concerns apart from from the stability of the dams structures well that's all that matters if they can't keep them underwater they have a, what good are they there hasn't been a dam established uh, or built that doesn't leak as one. And the fact that they say they want to walk away from 10 years leaves us a great deal of concern. Who's going to monitor these dams? Who's going to treat the water after? Uh, are they passing liabilities off to us, the taxpayers? There's no particular uh, amount of money set aside for the long term, although Rio Algom is a, a financially stable company and the amount of money we're talking about is not large at all. Uh, let's say a, a few million dollars put in a trust, if it had to be done that way, would, uh, would cover the, the maintenance, just the interest from it would cover the maintenance forever. So this is not a, a big financial uh, problem. There's not been a model established uh, that they can make reference to on these dams. According to a study that uh, I just recently read, there's 195 dams still in operation today, which were built approximately 1,800 years ago. 
and at that time uh, the state of engineering and construction of dams was a lot less than it is today. They say the dams are the best technology can supply in today's date. Well, I disagree. Because you have dams that are constructed out of cement, not barren or rock or earth. So technology tells me that there's a better dam option than what they've built. Concrete is a brittle structure. It can crack with any earth movement. movement. It can crack from shrinkage. Whereas earth dams are, uh, earth embankment dams as they're called, are uh, particularly sturdy. They, uh, they self-heal. Uh, they're solid. Uh, especially for these low structures, they're really the best kind of dam. They're better than a concrete dam, I would suggest. Tailings dam technology has progressed a lot since the battle days of the 1950s. How do you feel about the mine's reassurances that the flooded wetlands basically pose no threat to future generations? Well, I feel the way um, I feel the way I did after um, after the dam bro broke at um, at uh, Stanrock. Uh, I don't recall the the year that was, but I I was a I was an employee at Stanrock at the time. And the dam and the dam went out, and the re the effects of that dam going out were just tremendous. I mean, it washed the road out. We had to go across Quirk Lake in order to go into to work. Uh, I worked in a section of the on the surface that required us to be to provide power. I'm a stationary engineer, so we were a skeleton crew was required to be there. So we had to go into work, and we had to go in by by boat across Quirk Lake. But when we finally seen um, um, what had happened, um, it looked as though uh, uh, it looked as though something that was in your mind that might happen if an atomic bomb was dropped on a on a piece of property. There was a huge crater left where the all the tailings had gone out, and when we had seen it before, we had gone. We had. Uh, um, passed by these tailing dams each day on our way to and from work. And so we seen it as the, uh, I suppose the public would see the, uh, the, the, the controlled tailings that are being promoted now. All it was was, was, was water over top of this. And, and when you looked at it, it, was, it looked such like a, such a benign creature until it finally, until it went out and the dam broke, and then we seen the devastation, and then we suffered it down here as a result of that. Well, uh, they said before that dam went out that it was, a, that it was the best thing that uh, money could buy, that the experts had, uh, had all put their heads together and this thing was going to last a, a thousand years and more, and it didn't. Um, that engineering has come a long way since that time. But um, when I uh, look at the tailings, just one particular tailings, I look at the Quirk, Quirk uh, Mine tailings, Quirk 1, and look at that tailings that's two miles wide and a mile and a quarter or something, mile and a half wide by two miles long, and 70 feet, 80 feet deep of tailings in it. And I, and I think of that and when I look at the tailing dam that is containing that, and I say, for thousands and thousands of years, that stuff is going to be a potential threat to, to people. And for thousands and thousands of years, there's going to be a possibility that there is going to be some kind of a disaster. And that great engineered dam is going to fail. And it's going to happen. How does it make you feel? It makes you feel angry. It makes you feel afraid. Afraid, not for, not not afraid for yourself or even for for your children, but afraid for your children's 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 children. I mean, these the the people in the in in the future are going to be left with the legacy of of this, something that they had nothing to do with. And at some point, a disaster is going to happen over which they had no control. There is uncertainty 
in our minds that the preferred option by Rio Algom to cover the tailings with water uh, is a proven option. We have a lot of doubts. Our specialists have a lot of doubts. As I mentioned to you before, there's, there's no reason why we should not permit Rio Algom to construct internal dikes. They are aware that, that given the panel's recommendations, given final decisions over the next year or two, they may be required to take those dikes out. But putting them in right now certainly doesn't hurt anything. It doesn't, doesn't preclude the, the, the solutions, the other solutions to the decommissioning. And as I mentioned to you, it also improves the effect on the environment of the tailings in that no more acid is being generated on the tailings that are covered with water. Now, I, I sincerely hope that you're clear on this point because this is some, something that a lot of people are, are very, very unclear about, that we are allowing them to proceed with, with activities that we don't have any confidence in. The activities that they are proceeding with right now to cover the tailings with water do not harm the environment, do not pre preclude any other options being used in the future. They are spending their money in the hope that they can demonstrate to everybody that this is a viable option and that they will not have to undo it. And it's their choice. 